afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Velocity Tours webinar on uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos. My name is uh, Paulo Veloso. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Veloso Tours. And I will uh, just go through now uh, the, the various uh, steps uh, in this presentation. So I will uh, start with an introduction of Veloso Tours and Ecuador and the Galapagos. Then uh, we have my colleague Mauricio, He's going to um, talk about Quito. And then uh, my colleague Marcel will um, talk about the Galapagos Islands and the Highlands. Marcel is our main organizer in Quito. He's the power behind the scenes. You won't see him very often. He'll be uh, organizing everything behind the scenes. Then my colleague Hugh will talk about the yachts in the Galapagos. And Marcel will talk about the highlands a little bit. And I will talk again about the Amazon rainforest because I love the rainforest and I've been many times. And I'll go through some examples of the uh, Veloso Tours itineraries, uh, suggested itineraries. And then my colleague Berenice will uh, coordinate the questions and answers session at the end. So you can use the chat in Zoom to send her questions as we go along. And then Berenice will collate them at the end. Uh, and we'll go through any questions that you may have. So the, um, the um, first of all, I would talk a little bit about Veloso Tours. You can see these wonderful pictures. That was very much a highlight of the experience for me when I went to Galapagos a long time ago, snorkeling with the sea lions, and I tried to follow a sea lion. He was diving and he turned back, looked at me, said, what, you trying to follow me? And boof, just disappeared. Um, our ethos is to provide authentic experiences, enhancing your visit um, and focus on your interests. And that way sharing uh, uh, an understanding of local life, people and, and customs. And we do that by asking you to um, convey your interests. Uh, for example, uh, you like to spend more time in museums or not go to museums, uh, prefer markets or outdoors. And then we send that information to the guides so they know about you when you are there and try and match as much as possible the, um, the experience you have there. In, in, Recently, we had a client who liked beekeeping and he was in Chile. And the guy on part of the excursion took them for a, a short brief, a period to a, a place where they, were, they had beekeeping, a beekeeper. And uh, it was an amazing experience for them. They were so happy. Um, and uh, in that context, we also uh, tell you when you are traveling who the guide is who is going to meet you. And that way, you know who is um, coming to, um, to look after you at various steps, particularly the major ones. Um, now, we're not going to talk about the um, COVID situation because this is always changing. And obviously, the situation now, we're not traveling now. We're going to travel in the future. So the situation with COVID will be whatever it is at the time when you are traveling. Um, and so what I wanted to mention is that in this period, when we've been relatively quiet, we've had time to prepare uh, for the future. We have produced a new brochure on Latin America, which you can download um, uh, or we can send by post on our website, and the brochures. We've made a lot of improvements to our website with uh, new uh, images, lots of new images, uh, new tours, new itinerary download for all of the areas that we specialize in, um, Latin America, India, and China. The itinerary download allows you to, um, to see a day-by-day -day summary with your dates so that you can experiment with durations of how much you can do or you want or don't to do. And then you can go, we, we provide um, a, a detailed itinerary with a guaranteed price once we have the specific dates, we can tailor make it because we can look at the price of the flights on, at the time when you are, go, you are traveling. We've also got new maps linking with Google Maps. And so that's um, a, a very interesting highlight. Now let's focus on Ecuador. And in Ecuador, we have 
four distinct regions, uh, the Amazon, the Andean mountains, the highlands, and the Pacific coast. And then, of course, the jewel in the crown, the Galapagos Islands. We have here uh, an outline, uh, here the Amazon, the highlands, the coast, and the Galapagos. The coast is not so visited, although we do have an itinerary on our website that includes this Isla del Plata as a day trip. It's a um, kind of mini Galapagos. Um, so if anyone was interested, we can also offer that. Um, and um, so let's start the trip into Ecuador. We fly into Quito. And one of the special elements of our service is that you know who the guide is, the guide meets you at the airport and then he takes you to the center of, uh, to, of Quito, to your hotel and gives you an introduction. So I would like now to bring in my colleague, uh, Mauricio, who is in uh, Quito. He's uh, one of our main guides in Quito. We've worked with him for a long time. He also does trips down to Cuenca. He's very experienced. And so, Mauricio, are you there? Uh, hello. I'm right here. Hello, folks. Good afternoon from here, from this middle of the world. And I'm just going to do a quick introduction. You know, everything takes time. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of what you can see and appreciate the beauty of Quito. And after you arrive, this is what you'll be seeing. Beautiful colonial buildings, churches, gold gilded that you see it up there. Amazing neo-Gothic churches. This is one of the main squares in town, San Francisco, Our Lady of Mercy, San Francisco. So it's a big complex. You've got a lot of museums, a lot of things to do and to see. And remember also that Quito, it's the entrance to the visit, as Paolo was telling you, to the Amazon. So from here, we'll be heading to other parts of the country, like to the city of Queen. This is biosecurity. This is one of the many beautiful museums and buildings and also that we have in here in Quito. I'm following just this ozone security things that we have. Okay. This is now the reception, the ladies over there. You can appreciate all this beautiful building. By the way, this was actually a family home. And now it's a hotel, a very beautiful one, loaded with flowers. We can see the garden. And also, once you arrive to Quito, There will take you in all this excitement places to go and to see. Fantastic. So we are waiting for you. We hope to see you very soon. And remember, Ecuador is a country, as Paula was telling you, that you can see big, big changes within just a few minutes due to the Andes Mountains, the altitude that we have all the Galapagos with its unique flora and fauna. So we're waiting for you and it will be a pleasure to be with you. I think we have lost Mauricio, so we can 
maybe go on with the presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Mauricio. I, I guess, um, hi, my name is uh, Marcel. Um, I am um, the local representative uh, for Veloso in, in Ecuador. Um, and uh, part of the team that's behind Buenos the scenes. Dias. <laughs> and I, I'm just gonna share my screen on um, where we have a map of the Galapagos Islands and of Ecuador. Well, I'm also located in, in, in Quito. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a second so you can see where I am located. Um, behind me, we have the Panecillo Hill and it's a clear day in Quito with uh, sunny skies. Uh, we have um, behind me all the colonial downtown area. We can see the rooftops of the, what we have in Quito, the domes of the churches and the city uh, as a whole. I'm, uh, I'm sitting at the rooftop of uh, Ila Experience Hotel. This is in the heart of the downtown area. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now from Quito. Now we, Paulo has brought us here and said how we arrived by, by flight. There's a direct flight. Uh, uh, from uh, Madrid, uh, which is the connections uh, from the UK. And I'm going to talk a little bit of how to go onwards to the Galapagos Islands and what we will be able to encounter there. Uh, to get to the Galapagos Islands, well, uh, you need to arrive at least one night before in Quito or the city of Guayaquil, which is by the coast. Um, from either city, there's a direct flight to either Baltra or San Cristobal Island. Both islands have a, an airport. Um, on the Baltra, it's just um, next to Santa Cruz and uh, crossing the Tabaca Channel. And on San Cristobal Island, it's directly on the island close to the town. From both these locations uh, in, in the Galapagos Islands, we have airports that receive uh, flights that are um, commercial flights on the 727 plane. So it's a very comfortable flight. Uh, once you arrive in the Galapagos, you will go through the National Park Authority. You would pay your park tax and you can start enjoying this natural paradise. The Galapagos Islands, uh, the main reason to visit is the wildlife, the nature. These are islands of a volcanic formation. Um, we're gonna look into a little bit of the, um, the different slides of the Galapagos and I'm gonna explain something about the main islands, starting with Santa Cruz, San Cristobal, and then a few of the other islands. But first I wanna just give an idea of the naturalist guide. The naturalist guide makes your trip special in the Galapagos Islands. Why? Well, he's been trained by the Galapagos Park Authority, is an expert in natural history of the islands, has studied about uh, the findings of the Charles Darwin, who is actually well known in, in, the, in the UK for his uh, theory of evolution that was actually inspired by the islands themselves, the Galapagos archipelago. Uh, the guide has the ability to transmit the knowledge and we choose guys based on their charisma, their love and the passion for the Galapagos Islands. And the good thing is they are mainly natives of the Galapagos. So they've grown up here in these islands and they know them by heart and they can introduce them to you in a different way, in a different light that is not just limited to seeing the wildlife that's there and enjoying the snorkeling, the hiking and all this, uh, scenery that is surrounding you. It will also illustrate the trip with lectures and additional information. Now, starting with the island of Santa Cruz, as I mentioned before, this is where uh, right next to one of the main airports, the Balfour Airport. Um, there's several attractions on Santa Cruz. We have the Charles Darwin Research Station, which is an important scientific body that um, is helping preserve the islands, is sharing information to the Galapagos Park Authority and has several projects of bringing back uh, species to several islands. For example, um, it has a tortoise breeding center where it and it helps reintroduce the giant tortoises to islands that they did not have them for a while. Then of course, uh, on Santa Cruz, we have Black Turtle Cove, which is a mating site for uh, marine tortoises and uh, a nursing site for Galapagos reef sharks. Las Bachas, this is uh, another site where you will actually find nesting marine tur tur turtles on the beach. Um, nearby is South Plaza Island where we can find the uh, land iguanas. And a spe very special area on Santa Cruz Island is the highlands. Here we find the giant tortoises in the wild. So Santa Cruz Island uh, also is a place where you have most of the hotels in the Galapagos. So 
for travelers that are not taking a cruise, this is one of the islands they would be staying as a base, which is, as you heard, it's full of attractions. Amongst them also the marine iguanas. One particular thing about the Galapagos and what makes the island special and why travelers want to come to the Galapagos is the wildlife is not afraid of humans. As you can see, you can be very close to the wildlife. They are undisturbed. They've never been threatened, so they don't feel, they're not shy around humans. The other island I'm going to talk about now is San Cristobal Island, where the other airport is. Here we have an image of Kicker Rock. This is a beautiful snorkeling site um, with, where you have the possibility of uh, swimming with uh, hammerhead sharks, uh, sea lions, marine tortoises. But other attractions on San Cristobal is Puerto Chino, uh, Cerro Brujo, Isla Lobos. Isla Lobos is a small islet, uh, almost a sandbar where you have a large nesting site for the blue-footed booby. Then we have Punta Pit on San Cristobal, where you find the three types of booby birds, the red-footed, the Nazca, and the blue-footed booby in the same location. Other wildlife that is present at this location are frigate birds, and of course, giant tortoises as well. Here we have an image of a male frigate bird who's inflating his pouch to attract the females. Fernandina Island. Fernandina is a very special island because it's one of the more remote islands of the Galapagos and it's one of the younger islands. It's an island that can only be reached on a liveaboard cruise. Um, it has three visitor sites. Uh, well, actually two, Punta Espinosa and Cabo Douglas. La Cumbre is, one of the, is the volcano on, on Fernandina. The wildlife here is quite unique actually because you have a lot of endemic species. You have the flightless cormorant, and this is the only spot in the Galapagos together with the western side of uh, Isabela Island where you'll spot this, this specific bird that has lost its ability to fly so it could swim better since it did not have land predators, but it, had, it needed to actually be a better swimmer and, and fish. You have penguins. Penguins at the equator line. That is a, a big rarity, but it's unique to the Galapagos Islands as well. Sea lions, marine iguanas, and lava lizards are other species that can be found on Fernandina. Some of the sea lions, and, the, and as you can see, they're not shy amongst humans. Uh, another special island I want to mention is Española. And here we have two main visitor sites. One of them is Gardner Bay. It's a, it's a beach that is considered one of the most beautiful in the world uh, by several magazines. And it's been reported as one of the best places to spot wildlife uh, as a beach itself. And Punta Suarez. This is a special location because you have the world population of the waved albatros. It's a 45 minute walk to their nesting site. Apart from seeing them perform their mating dance, honking, rubbing beaks, and doing the sky uh, watch, uh, you know, aiming their head up to the sky and, and, and as they, they do the courtship, because the waved albatros mates for life, you also have another special location here, which is, we, can, we call it uh, locally as uh, the Galapagos, uh, the Albatros Airport. Here, juvenile albatrosses learn to fly in a very particular way. They run off the cliff and they take a dive and it seems like they're gonna crash into the rocks. But at the last moment, they open up their wings and they graciously lift up, up again. The albatros flies for six years out in the ocean before it comes back to Hispaniola to mate again. This is the only place in the world where the waved albatros mates. So it's a very special location. Uh, and it's also a visitor site that can be reached by a liverboard cruise, but also as a day trip from San Cristobal Island. Other species here are the mockingbirds, the marine, marine iguanas, lava lizards, Nazca boobies. One thing about the mockingbirds, they will actually chase down your water bottles as you are at Gardner Bay. Uh, a lava lizard here, one of the other species that is, it's a colonizing species of the Galapagos. Uh, Bartolome, this is an island that's in the center part of the Galapagos, in the heartland. And as you can see, there's an amazing view from the, the summit. We have uh, the bay. You can also, what's important about Bartolome is it is an important snorkeling site where you can have the possibility of snorkeling with penguins, rays, sea lions, sea turtles. So this is, uh, shows the, you know, the volcanic past of the Galapagos. Here's one of the penguins. Uh, and to note one thing that's special about these islands is that each island is the tip of an underwater volcano. So it, 
we have a lot of uh, geology to talk about as well in the islands. Another special island in this archipelago is Genovesa. Here we have two visitor sites. One of them is Darwin Bay, and the other one is Prince Philip Steps, also known as El Barranco. El Barranco is special because you have thousands of seabirds flying around the cliff, and they nest along the cliff. But what you can spot with the help of your naturalist guide is hawks and owls that are waiting to prey upon these seabirds. So it's a natural spectacle. Um, species that you can find here are Nazca boobies, red-footed boobies. This is one of the only nesting sites together with Punta Pit on San Cristobal Island where you can find a red-footed booby. Swallow-tailed gulls, red-billed tropic birds, also sea lions, and the snorkeling at this island is, it, I would say it is uh, very interesting because you have a uh, white tip reef shark nursing area, but you also have sea lions, marine tortoises. You have schools of the tropic fish that will swim below you. Here we have uh, an image of the blue-footed booby performing its mating ritual. This is on, this actually picture was taken on North Samer Island. It's a very small island actually, just north of uh, Santa Cruz. Now, I'm also going to mention Floriana Island because the Galapagos, apart from the natural history, also has human history. And here we have an image of the post office barrel. Uh, I recommend you bring your postcards. Uh, you're ready. Otherwise, on board the boat, they, will, they, they are available as well. Um, you, if you fill in your postcard and you put it inside the barrel, another fellow traveler will come around. And if he lives nearby you, he will deliver it to your doorstep. We expect you to do the same. That's one of the possibilities and one of the interesting things you can learn about the Galapagos and also the human history that is behind this and the story of the first settlers of the Galapagos Islands. Other interesting sites at Floriana is Devil's Crown. It is one of the top snorkeling sites. Cormorant Point, uh, where you have an olive-colored sand beach. So that's another interesting thing. Many beaches in the Galapagos have different colors of sand, red sand, white sand, black sand, green sand, because of the geology of the islands. Also in, on um, Floriana, you have schools of flamingos. Other islands that are notably important are Isabella Island, which is um, one of the largest in the Galapagos. North Seymour, which I mentioned where you had that, uh, the blue-footed boobies courting. Uh, it's just north of Santa Cruz and Santiago Island in the center of the archipelago. They all have their natural attractions and each island is different. Now, what to consider when you travel to the Galapagos? Uh, well, first of all, the itinerary. It's uh, the wildlife in the Galapagos is always gonna be the same, whether you take a cruise or you stay at a hotel. Uh, the experience will be different. That's why the itinerary is important. So if you take a cruise, you wanna decide on the length of the cruise. Now at Veloso, uh, the recommendation is eight days at least because you're traveling all the way from you know the uk all the way to south america and it takes some time to get here and it's best to spend it um you know getting over the jet lag and being able to enjoy the the cruise the best because the first day and the last day of your cruise are going to be transit times so they're half days the another important factor is the size of the vessel if you choose a larger vessel you have more people to socialize if you choose a smaller vessel you have a little bit more privacy the quality of the vessel when we talk about the quality all vessels are are safe, they're great, uh, they're very comfortable and all, but some vessels are really premium with private balconies and special features. Um, cabin stateroom preferences, do you want an indoor cabin, an outdoor cabin? Of course, price will vary in those. Family facilities, not just facilities, but you know, on larger boats, you have a, a playroom for children, but also there is family departures. So that's another thing to take into account. Special interests, if it's a bird watching departure, or a singles departure you, in the, or single cabins or stay in a hotel, as I mentioned before, instead of taking a cruise. If you're not keen to sleep on board a boat and spend all your time on board a boat throughout several nights, you can stay at a hotel on one of the inhabited islands, mainly Santa Cruz or San Cristobal and take day trips. Now, I'm just gonna go a little bit further and talk about one of the boats in the Galapagos Islands and what the cruise experience is like. Uh, this is a catamaran, it's the Seaman Journey. It's a first class boat. It has several itineraries, but as we mentioned, our preference is to suggest the seven night programs. Uh, and this boat offers comfort adventure service because it also offers value. It's not one of the more expensive and it's not one of the more luxurious, but it's one, it offers really good value. It, it's equipped, fully equipped with snorkeling equipment, sea kayaks for exploration, 
Here we have a view of one of the cabins. This is a matrimonial cabin with a queen size bed. And what's the experience on board a boat? Uh, I'm just gonna go into that detail. Uh, what is a day like in the Galapagos Islands cruising? Well, you have an early wake up call at 6 a.m. We know you're on vacation, but we want to take advantage of the full daylight hours in the Galapagos. You have an early breakfast, usually buffet, um, with fresh food, of course. That is important to note that you know Ecuador itself and the, the Galapagos being part of Ecuador has a lot of uh, varieties of fruit and fresh produce. Um, after a hearty breakfast, you have your first hike in the islands or, or the first hike of the day, which lasts anywhere from two hours, one and a half to two hours. Um, that is actually one of the, um, the highlights of the day, the first hike. The trail will be about a mile, so you have to be able to walk on assisted for a mile, and you will encounter the wildlife in company of your naturalist guide who will help point out the different encounters you have and explain the geology and the history of that particular island. Then after the hike, you have a 45 minute to one hour snorkeling session. Uh, this is uh, going to take note that the wildlife under the surface of the Galapagos, the marine life is just as impressive as the wildlife on the islands. Manta rays, sea turtles, small white tip reef sharks, and a lot of other adventures underwater. As Paolo mentioned, sea lions that are very playful. Then we avoid the midday sun. We're back on board for lunch. We have a small time to take a nap or wash up in your, in your cabin with a shower. Um, and then we're at the next visitor site in the afternoon. This could take a short navigation to cross the bay or go to the other side of the same island. And you will have a, a 45 to one hour snorkeling and then a three, uh, two, two hour hike, uh, more or less. Back on board, we have an evening lecture before, before or after dinner. And then we take advantage of the nighttime to sail to the next island. That way, every day you're waking up at a different island with a different view, with an impressive scenery every morning. And every afternoon you have a different sunset. That's the advantage of cruising. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on to Hugh. He's going to explain a little bit more about other boats and other uh, areas of the Galapagos. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll be back. Thank you, um, Marcel. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen now and uh, bring up the presentation. Okay. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay. Well, the first, uh, I'm just going to take you through a few examples of some of the yachts and ships uh, just to give you a flavor of the different options. Um, the Beluga is a very popular yacht with the uh, Veloso clients. Um, as Marcel was saying, it's a smaller yacht uh, uh, with up to 16 guests and that gives a sort of atmosphere of conviviality. So I think a lot of people like that. Obviously you get to know your fellow uh, travellers and the crew very well, uh, very closely on a seven night cruise on the Beluga, but um, it very much um, is part of the experience, is this, is this sort of camaraderie that you make. That's an example of the cabin. Um, that's a lower deck cabin with a porthole. And one of the other things about the Beluga is the sun deck where um, our fresco dining is, is one of the special experiences for um, uh, your time in the Galapagos. And when the weather's good, that is a, such a lovely thing to do. And then when it gets dark, of course, uh, stargazing becomes another experience that a lot of people really love and they'll go up onto the sun deck and um, on some cruises you can get specialist advice on the stars that look beautiful in that remote area. Um, a slightly larger, an example of a slightly larger ship up to 48 passengers and a more luxurious one is La Pinta. Um, uh, this uh, ship uh, offers a slightly more sophisticated upscale experience um, and I think with the larger ships uh, you obviously get more facilities um, and you get more in terms of uh, slightly more formal arrangements for dining and more public space. So here's an example of a cabin or a stateroom on La Pinta. As you can see the floor to ceiling windows and that is the lounge where in the evening you can relax and uh, the guides would meet you and you can chat about the day or the uh, next day ahead. So it's a slightly more stable vessel. Obviously, the bigger the vessel, the less swell you will feel when the vessel is moving. So some people prefer larger vessels for the stability. Um, in the Galapagos, the largest uh, number of people that can be taken on a ship is they restricted to 90 passengers. And this is one of the largest ships, but uh, it, is, uh, it was refurbished in 2000 completely, 2017. 
and offers a, a choice of itineraries. But as I say, the larger ships have a range of facilities that the smaller yachts don't have. For example, on this ship, there's an auditorium where um, you can hear lectures from the guides. There's also a swimming pool on board and other facilities. And this is a good choice if you're a multi-generational family group or you perhaps want to take the grandchildren on a trip. Um, you can see here uh, an example of a cabin with a nice big picture window and um, the uh, area on the sun deck where again our fresco dining is a feature um, and particularly uh, enjoyable. Uh, if you're looking for a bit of adventure then the Mary Ann is an interesting choice and a good choice. Um, it is one of the few ships, it's a motor sailor, but actually it sails, uh, you, they turn the engines off and it can sail under the uh, under its sails, you know, under the wood wind. And um, it's a much more participative experience. You're very much more involved in the ship's activities if you want to. Um, uh, for example, if you can see from this image here, there's a chap there helping the crew uh, pull, pull the sails up, um, uh, which makes it for a slightly more active trip, but one that um, we've had a lot of people go on this vessel because it's a uh, it provides, a, as I say, a real sense of adventure. It's also good for solo travellers because they have a number of single only cabins, which people like. Um, going up market, this is perhaps one of the most luxurious vessels in the Galapagos. It's certainly the most famous one from a point of view of its namesake. You can see it's called the Grace, and that's because it's named after the Princess Grace of Monaco and it offers a sort of timeless elegance and beauty. So it's a more formal um, environment. You really do feel like you're on your own private yacht. They have some fabulous seven night itineraries um, and some very famous people in the past have sailed on it, not in the Galapagos. Winston Churchill obviously uh, sailed in the Mediterranean when it was owned by Princess Grace. You can see from that image of the um, uh, cabin, the sort of style of the vessel. So it is more formal. But if you're celebrating an anniversary, perhaps, or you're just looking for something a bit special, then this could be a choice for you. Um, there are a number of catamarans, uh, luxury catamarans available uh, in the Galapagos. And this is a good example. It's very popular in the British, for British people. Again, up to 16 guests. It was uh, completely refurbished last year, actually, under new ownership. And um, the thing about a catamaran is they're actually quite stable. So from a cruising perspective, that's very good if you're, if you're, if you're worried about the swell in the, in the water. Um, and it also it has quite a fast uh, cruising speed. Um, the uh, thing that I wanted to note about the Ocean Spray is that it's one of the few, not many vessels in the Galapagos have private balconies in their cabins. So if that was something that really appeals, in other words, you've, you know, you've come off your excursion and you want a bit of privacy in your cabin, but you still want to enjoy open air views, then that would be a good choice for you. Um, as Marcel said, uh, you, if you don't like uh, uh, cruising or it's something that you're not particularly sure of, then you could consider staying on uh, in a hotel on land. And uh, one of the most popular hotels is the Finch Bay Hotel on Santa Cruz Island, which is located close to Puerto Aurora. Um, as you can see from the image, it's a very it's a lovely hotel with a beautiful aspect and a lovely beach. Uh, and it owns its own um, day cruiser called the Sea Lion that runs excursions to nearby islands, Bartolomeu, South Plaza, North Seymour and Santa Fe. Um, obviously, you won't be able to go to the remote islands if you stay on land, um, but uh, it, is a, it is definitely an option. There you can see an example of one of their rooms and, um, and there is the, uh, the Sea Lion itself. Uh, and also, because it's on Santa Cruz, it's actually walking distance um, to the Charles Darwin um, uh, Research Centre. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention on my part of the talk is that uh, we, Velocitors, are partners with the Galapagos Conservation Trust in the UK. Um, we're very happy and very proud to be part of that, to working with them. They are a great uh, resource for anybody that's interested in planning a trip to the Galapagos. And if you're not aware of them, then I would recommend checking out their website. Um, you can see some of the projects that are on the go at the moment, particularly saving some endangered species. species. Um, and if you book with the Lasso tours to the Ecuador and the Galapagos, then obviously we will give uh, six months free membership. So that's just something to be aware of. So I hope that's been of interest. And I'm now going to pass you back to Marcel in Quito. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Hugh. That was a 
that was uh, very important to know about all the boats and all the products in Galapagos. Um, now we're going to go back into the Andes. This is uh, once again, I'm, uh, I'm uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm in Quito right now. This is part of the Andes. Um, the city of Quito is, um, as Mauricio mentioned, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it's, uh, in, it's located in an inter-Andean Valley. Uh, we're at 2,800 meters of altitude, which gives us a view uh, of uh, the, the mountains nearby us. We can have, uh, on a clear day, we'll be able to spot three or four volcanoes just from the city center. And one of them uh, is, is the Cotopaxi volcano, which is just south of uh, the city of Quito. Before we go there, uh, just to mention uh, the heritage of the city, um, the buildings in Quito are Andalusian style, but they are blended in with indigenous uh, craft and, and lore. And well, behind me, you saw the Panecillo Hill. Here's a picture of it as well. We also have um, Gothic churches and uh, other elements. Uh, and of course, the middle of the world line which is uh, where we have the equator and you can actually jump from one side to the other. All these can be visited on walking tours. Uh, um, you can interact with local people and guides like Mauricio will take you around. Um, nearby, as I mentioned, is Cotopaxi. This is one of the highest active volcanoes in the world, uh, but just not just the volcanoes located here, but the national park. And in its surroundings, you have the possibility of spotting Andean condors. There is, a, there is lakes, mountain lakes, that are nearby the volcano, and it makes for a great backdrop to take pictures with the lake and the mountain on a clear day. There is the possibility of walking up to the glacier, and these are actually the headwaters of the Amazon, part of them, actually. The, 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 the water that trickles down from Cotopaxi into the streams and down into the Amazon is what feeds this amazing river as well. well other parts of the Andes, we have, uh, as I mentioned, Crater Lakes. Uh, we also have the cultures. And one of the most important cultures in the Andes of Ecuador is the Otavalo culture. They there is an indigenous market. Here you have the possibility of bartering or negotiating with the indigenous people of Otavalo and practicing your Spanish as well. Another important feature of this area is visiting workshops of the indigenous people. Here you can find them um, weaving on the backstrap loom, or we can visit a musical instrument uh, workshop where they actually craft by hand the musical instruments that are used by Andean groups that play around the world. And you'll have uh, perhaps an interpretation of the Condor Pasa as you visit them as well. So that's a little bit about the Andes. Uh, a little bit south of Quito, uh, we have the town of Baños. It literally translates to baths because there's hot springs in this area. This is the cloud forest area. It is the transition zone between the Andes and the Amazon rainforest. So it's a very interesting area where you have a different vegetation. It, as we descend from the Andes towards the Amazon a little, we have the, the vegetation grows in size. We have waterfalls, we have a really important bird watching. Here we have a hummingbird, which is one of the icons of Ecuador and the cloud forest. Of course, you will have some rain, but uh, don't worry, the temperature is not too cold. And, the cultural interaction of just walking around one of these small villages in this area, it is impressive. Also, an important city in Ecuador that I do not want to leave out is Riobamba. It is the it is the heartland of Ecuador. It was actually the first capital before the capital was moved to, to Quito. This was in the well, because of the volcanic eruptions in the area. We are in the avenue of the volcanoes. And it has the highest concentration of indigenous people in the country, the city of Riobamba. It's also a colonial city with uh, churches that go back to the 1500s, 1600s. Um, cultural expression nearby, uh, there's a small town called Wano. And here people weave rugs by hand. And one of the um, anecdotes is the rugs at the Ela Experience Hotel in the downtown area of Quito were woven by a family from Wano. So you can actually visit and see how these rugs are, hand, rugs are handcrafted. Cuenca, well, further down the Andes and in the southern part of Ecuador, Cuenca is also a UNESCO heritage city. Um, Cuenca has the particular fact that you have one church for every week of the year. There's 48 churches in the colonial downtown area of Cuenca, and they, they all expose the Holy Grail throughout the, the year, but they're filled with impressive colonial art, with paintings that date back uh, to not just uh, 
the arrival of the Spaniards as conquistadors, but the indigenous hand that blended in with the Spanish school of art. So you have that, in, that eclectic feel. And then another important thing in, to find in Cuenca is the straw hat weaving. You have weavers that you will find them around the plazas, ladies that are sitting down, they're chatting amongst each other, and they're weaving a straw hat. The straw hat that was mistakenly called as Panama hat because during the construction of the canal, they imported hats from Ecuador for the workers. But the real name of these hats are Paja Toquilla hats. And you can meet the weavers that are making these hats. There's also the flower plaza in Cuenca where you can see roses from Ecuador. Ecuador is one of the largest exporter of roses from around the world with um, different varieties, but not just roses, but tropical flowers as well. That's one of the industries we have in the, the country. Now, from the Andes, the next uh, important area of Ecuador is the Amazon rainforest. Paulo, uh, I'm gonna pass this back to you. Thank you for having me here. And uh, Paulo has been to the Amazon several times. So he's gonna explain about the uh, different varieties of trips that you can take there. Well, hello, I will uh, share my screen and uh, we'll go through the Amazon. I, I'm a great fan of the Amazon in different regions for the, um, can everyone see the, the slide, the presentation? Yeah. Um, one of the main, or well, actually just loading, um, the main regions as we saw in, um, on the map in Ecuador um, is this eastern side. The Amazon basin is gigantic. Um, and Ecuador has a part of it. Now there is, uh, at the foothills of the Andes, there's encro human encroachment, of, of course, and uh, some um, oil exploration, in fact. But from Coca eastwards, they had, it's pristine rainforest, the same in, as in the south of the Amazon uh, region of Ecuador. And they've invested in um, lodges um, and facilities and guides for they've been for over 30 years, I think I, uh, the first time I went there. So you have this beautiful pristine rainforest, um, dense, dense tree cabinet canopy, and lodges like this one, which are made, thatched roofs and very much the character and, and the feeling of the, the, the area you are in. Um, in this particular case, also the uh, canoes for the excursions to bring you to the lodge. Some are motorized, but some are not. And it's very important to have that silence to hear all the sounds of the forest. The um, density of the vegetation and the tree canopy mean that uh, you don't actually see a lot of wildlife, but you can hear it. And um, one of the times when I was there, one of the highlights was um, the um, sound of howler monkeys in the distance it echoes through the forest and it's, it's amazing. Another wonderful experience was um, the rain in early morning. It was raining, not very heavy, but it was raining. And so the tranquility, the silence and the, and the, and the, and the rain coming onto the uh, roofs, these thatched roofs was wonderful. Now, one of the uh, experiences in, in the forest is actually walking through the forest on unmarked trails. And the significance of the unmarked trails is that the density of the tree canopy does not allow any light through and you cannot see the, um, the sky. So there isn't a lot of undergrowth as you would be if there was more light coming through, but it also means that you could, one person can be lost in the, in the, under the tree canopy. The guides of course know the way and everything looks the same in all directions, but it is a, a wonderful uh, asset that we have in the world is this dense rainforest that we don't want to, uh, to miss in any way. You can stay in, this, in a lodge or you can uh, take a trip on a boat. Uh, this is when it's on the uh, Rio Napo and they, they have wonderful facilities, air conditioning. You are kind of more distant from the, um, the, the forest because you are on the river, but you have excellent facilities and uh, uh, a deck on top to uh, have a few drinks after the excursions. You have cabins with a big, large picture window towards the outside. And um, that's very much also a highlight because the boat is moving down the river. 
Now, I would like to um, just bring this all together um, to get, provide some examples of itineraries where you might see some of these regions on, on a particular tour. And of course, we can tailor make the, um, the itineraries, we can tailor make the tours, but um, we can also take the ones that we have in the brochure and on the website as a way to visualize what you could do in two weeks, let's say. So in this case, the Pichincha tour um, refers to the Amazon and the Galapagos. So you have time in Quito. Uh, these two nights is actually one day, more or less, because it's a daytime flight. You arrive in the evening and here the same. You arrive back in the afternoon, stay one day, and then you leave early morning to the Galapagos. So this is an example of one where you would visit the Galapagos and the Amazon. This one would be the Avenue of Volcanoes, the central highlands where you'd be in Quito and then continue uh, along the Avenue of Volcanoes to Cuenca, end up late in the afternoon in Guayaquil and then take the tour. Another example is one where for three weeks where you could do all three regions. So stay in Quito, the Amazon, then the Avenue of Volcanoes, the trip to Cuenca, Guayaquil and the Galapagos. In addition, we have a series of tours called landmark tours where you can combine several countries. And in this case, we have an example of an itinerary where you would travel around Peru, like Titicaca, Cusco, Machu Picchu, then go back to Quito. You could add more time in Ecuador uh, if you wish, if you have time, and then take a Galapagos uh, cruise at the end. And another example of a landmark tour is uh, one where we call the Encantada tour, where you could go to Galapagos, then travel to Peru, uh, Cusco, Machu Picchu, and then you could go to Lake Titicaca, and then enter Bolivia to visit La Paz. You could continue further in Bolivia to go to Sucre and Potosí, and then you can come back from Rio de Janeiro. So this is the example of uh, one of uh, these trips. We can take them as they are, or they can be tailor-made. And now if you had, have any questions, if I can ask Berenice to uh, tell us any questions. Um, no, we don't have any questions from the chat box. However, we do have some someone who asked for the name of the hotel that we saw with Mauricio at the beginning. Uh, we reply on the chat box, but we'll say it again, it's the Casa Congotena. Uh, so this, this hotel is uh, in the San Francisco uh, Plaza, which is the main plaza, the main place actually in, the, uh, in, uh, in Quito. But otherwise, we do not have any other questions so far. Excellent. Well, if, um, if that's okay, then um, thank you very much for um, attending. I hope it was useful and then contact us with any questions anytime. So thank you very much. And we'll see you again in one of the other webinars. Bye-bye, thank you.